works. <laughs> this is good. Thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our house. Um, hopefully there's no uh, technical difficulties today, and if there are, we apologize. Um, this, the uh, first part of the lecture today is Torah. What's in a word? So this week, my thought will examine just how much we can learn from one word in the Torah. We are presently reading in the synagogue from the fourth book of the Torah, uh, the book of Bamidbar, or as it's called in English, Numbers. Both names connect to a certain logic. The Hebrew word Bamidbar translates to mean in the desert. The book contains a record of the travels of the children of Israel as they wandered through the desert for the 40 years. On the other hand, the book begins with the counting of the Jewish nation that were redeemed from Egypt, who were now traveling in the wilderness. So giving the book the name Numbers, alluding to that count, is also logical. In fact, the book is referred to in Hebrew as Sefer Pikudim, the book of counting. The Shem Mishmuel states that a major part of the portion of the uh, Sedra, the portion of Bamidbar, is a long list of names and numbers. He asks, why are there so many verses occupied with endless statistics? The Zohar tells us that the desert was a place to conquer, both physically and spiritually. It represented the forces of evil. So the mission of the children of Israel as they traveled through the desert was to overpower these evil forces and subjugate them to good. It is an established principle uh, of Jewish thought that anything which is counted is valuable and will not easily merge with other things. So counting gives the subject a, a feeling of worth. So the Jewish nation approached the desert as a numbered people, confident of their role and the spiritual demands that awaited them. If you look into the Torah, you'll notice that the children of Israel were only counted immediately before a war, whether the conflict was physical or a spiritual battle. The first time they were counted was when Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, took his family down to Egypt. Then they were only 70 souls. They were about to descend into the morally deprived environment of Egypt, and they needed strength to survive the process of assimilation which lay before them. The next time they were counted was after the sin of the eagle, uh, the golden calf. When the nation stood at the foot of Mount Sinai, they accepted the Torah, which allowed them to correct the sin of Adam, first man. Man was originally created immortal, but by eating from the tree of knowledge, he brought death into the world. Now, through the nation's acceptance of the Torah, God forgave Adam's sin, and so, for a short time, they too were immortal. However, when they made the golden calf, they reversed their gain. They left themselves vulnerable to the forces of evil. They then needed the protection of the counting to help them prevail in their daily struggles. They were also counted before they entered the land of Canaan. This was prior to their battles with the seven nations of the land. One time, they were counted when there was no war or a situation that warranted a count. That was during the reign of Dabramel, King David. His count brought with it death to the people. Counting done with proper reason and method can bring that about positive results. But counting, just for the sake of pride or arrogance, can bring about death and destruction. But let us break down the Hebrew word by Midbar and see what else we can learn from the word. In addition, let us examine what the gematri of the word may teach us. The Hebrew word by Midbar can be broken up into two words, bum, dibar. The word can then be translated as in them one should speak. The word bum is made up of two Hebrew letters, a bays and a mem. This is an allusion to both the written Torah, which begins with the Hebrew letter bays from the opening word in the Torah, bereshit, in the beginning and the oral Torah, the Mishnah, which begins with the letter Mem. The first word in the Mishnah is Me'endosai, from when. The Gemachi of the Hebrew word Bum is 42. This is relevant, since in the end of the fourth book of the Torah in the portion of Masai, Moshe Rabbeinu recalls for the people 
all the journeys that the children of Israel experienced during their 40 years of wandering in the desert. In all, there were 42 stops. The question that we must ask is why was it necessary for the Jewish nation to move 42 times in their journey in the wilderness? So our sages tell us that the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, cannot rest in a place where impurity resides. So, whenever the nation sinned in a location, that sin brought about a defilement, making it necessary for them to move to another location. Both the wandering and the inconvenience that it caused brought about an atonement for whatever sin the nation had transgressed, so that the Shekhinah, the divinity of God who once again returned and dwell in the tabernacle. The Orachayim HaKadosh states, according to Kabbalah, that their travels to various places was done so as to be able to locate and rescue stray sparks of holiness. So, so which answer is correct? After all, they seem to contradict one another. Both of these answers can be true. Some of their travels could have been seen as positive, and others could have been due to negative actions that they perpetrated. This teaches us an important lesson in life, that though at times things may be perceived as negative, they may in reality turn out to be positive, and the opposite may also be true. That though we may perceive something as positive, in hindsight, we may come to realize that it was really a negative. Given a choice, one should always search for the good in everything that we experience. After all, God, pardon me, after all, good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. At all of these 42 stopovers, Moshe taught the Jewish nation the Torah. That is why we refer to him as Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher. All other rabbis receive their greatness from teaching us Torah, which is why we honor them with the title rabbi, which means teacher a title which precedes their name. Moshe's greatness was achieved by him being Moshe, so his name is mentioned first, Moshe and then Rabbeinu. As an aside, the gematri of the name Moshe Rabbeinu is 613, the same number as the commandments of the Torah. The Holy Baal Shem Tov tells us that these 42 stopovers that the Jewish nation experienced as they journeyed through the desert were a hint to us that in our personal lives, each one of us would experience 42 major events. Some of these incidents may seem major and others minor. Much depends on our perception. But we must know that just like the children of Israel in the desert were tested by God, so too will each one of us encounter 42 tests in our lives. The word bum is found in the holiest prayer that we recite three times daily the Shema Yisrael, Hero Israel. In it we say the Hebrew words, Bidibarta Bum, and you shall speak of them. To whom? The verse tells us, Vishinantan Levanecha, and you shall teach them to your children. That we as parents have an obligation to teach our children, and if we do, then we have, pardon me, we have to teach our children Torah. If we do, then we have what to talk about them with. But the Bart of Bum, and she'll speak in them. Then there is no generation gap. After all, the five year old child and the 85 year old grandfather are both learning the exact same book. The word Shinantum, which means you shall teach them, has in it the Hebrew word Shain, which means teeth. When you instruct your children, make sure to do so with a smile. Show them your teeth. Only if that approach doesn't work do we take a more assertive approach of the Barta, a stronger language. There just happens to be 42 words in the first paragraph of the Shema. Nothing is an accident. The Gamachi of the Hebrew word by Midbar is 248, which alludes to the 248 positive commandments in the Torah. So, so why is that important? We have been taught by our sages that the Messiah will come riding in on a donkey. Well, in olden times, <laughs> that might have been normative. But what about today? One would think that he should come riding in in a chauffeured limousine or at least a BMW. The Hebrew word for donkey 
is chamor. The word chamor has a gematria, a numerical value of 248. We know that nothing is an accident. So what is the connection between the, the donkey's gematria of 248 and the 248 positive commandments in the Torah? We have been told by our sages that if we transgress one of the 365 negative commandments in the Torah, that we can repent that sin. If we do repent, we will be forgiven. The concept of what we call tshuva, repentance. God, in his capacity of a loving father, tells us that not only will he forgive our sin, but in addition, if we repent out of love, what we refer to as tshuva me'ahava, then he will turn our transgression into a mitzvah. Now this transformation from a transgression to a mitzvah is only applicable for the 365 negative transgressions. However, if we fail to perform one of the 248 positive commandments, then there is no action that we can correct. We have just lost an opportunity to fulfill one of God's commandments. And this is why it is the 248 positive commandments that will bring the Messiah. This is alluded to by the donkey. It is not the negative actions that we perform that prevent the redemption. We have the ability to correct them. It is the positive acts that we fail to perform that prevent his coming. So in order for us to bring in the coming of the Messiah, we must first perform the 248 positive commandments which God in his Torah has commanded us to observe. We can also read the word in Hebrew by Midbar as base daber, that two people should speak. In order for a conversation to exist, there needs to be at least two people involved. We have been told by our sages that one should learn Torah with a chavrusa, a study partner. It states in the last mission in the tractate of Uksin, Rabbi Shulban Levi said, the Holy One, blessed be he, said, I will in the future cause every righteous person to inherit 310 worlds. We may ask, why the number 310? We have been commanded by God in his Torah to observe 613 commandments. In addition, the rabbis have added seven more laws, such as making blessings, lighting Shabbos candles, Hanukkah, Purim, etc., bringing the total commandments to 620. Since Torah should be studied together with the Chavrusa, then each one receives half of the reward, hence 310 worlds each. We have a belief that even in the next world, we will study Torah with the Chavrusa. They tell a story about a great rabbi. He wanted to know who would be a study partner in the next world. And so he fasted a Chalom Halayla, a prophetic revelation in a dream at night, in the hope that heaven would reveal to him who his study partner would be in the next world. He received an answer. He was told that his chavrusa would be Moshe the butcher. Well, the rabbi thought, well, somehow heaven had given him the wrong answer. So he fasted again, and he received the same reply. But the second reply came with a warning. <clears throat> Excuse me, that it was Moshe the butcher who would be a study partner in the next world, and that he should not treat the answer lightly. Realizing that the dream must be true, the rabbi decided that if Moshe the butcher was to be a study partner in the next world, then Moshe must be one of the Lamed Vav, one of the 36 hidden righteous individuals that exist in every generation. So he went to Moshe's butcher store to investigate, and he, he was hoping to see some sign that would explain to him how it was that Moshe would be his partner in the next world. He went to Moshe's store and he stayed outside and just watched for a while. The truth is he saw nothing out of the ordinary. Moshe was a butcher. He cut meat, he weighed the meat, he collected money, he took care of his customers. He was a butcher. But the rabbi knew that there had to be more. And so he waited for a lull in the business. He waited until the store was empty and then he entered and introduced himself to Moshe. Well, Moshe was very impressed that the rabbi was taking such an interest in him. The rabbi looked at Moshe and he said, Moshe, what's so special about you? <laughs> Moshe smiled. Special? Rabbi, there's nothing special about me. I'm a butcher. 
I do what all other Jews do. I daven three times a day, eat kosher, learn as much as I can, give charity. Now, I'm like everyone else. I I'm not special. The rabbi shook his head and said, No, Moshe, you are special. I know for a fact that you will be mechavrusa in the next world. Think, maybe there was something in your past that you did that would warrant that you and I should be together in the next world. Moshe thought for a moment. And then he said, well, there may be one thing. He said that many years ago, as I was looking outside my store window, I happened to notice a caravan that had stopped in the middle of the street. At the back of the caravan, I happened to see a young girl. Uh, she was crying bitterly. He said that, he, that she looked Jewish. I had no customers in the store, and so I walked over to the young girl, and I began to speak with her. It seemed that her town had been overrun by marauders and that they had killed her parents. Now, they were taking her to the slave market to be sold. I told her not to cry and that I would see what I could do. So I went over to the captain of the caravan and asked him about the young Jewish girl. Hmm. He offered to sell her to me, but for an inflated price. He knew that I was Jewish and he didn't want to miss the opportunity to make a nice profit. So I paid him whatever he wanted and I invited the young lady to live in my house and we brought her up as one of my own children. When she came of marriageable age, I took, I took my son Chaim aside and I told him that I had some good advice for him. I proposed that he marry this young girl. She had matured into a beautiful young lady inside and out. I assured him that I would pay for all the expenses for the wedding and in addition that I would even provide her with a dowry since she had no parents. My son Chaim, being a good boy, accepted my advice and the date was set for the two to wed. On the day of the wedding, everyone in the town was invited, even strangers and wayfarers. The tables were set with food and beverages, everything, everything was perfect. But then as I looked at the back of the hall, I noticed there was one table where it seemed that people were actually crying. So I went to the table to see what was happening. I thought that maybe they needed more food or mashka. I asked them why they were so unhappy. After all, this was a simcha. They told me how could they not cry after listening to the story that the young stranger who was sitting at their table was telling them. So I walked over to the young man and I took him outside. I thought maybe he needed some money or, or a place to stay for a while. He began to tell me a story. It seemed that he lived in a certain village and when he was born, his parents and their close friends signed a contract that when he and the daughter of his friend reached marriageable age, that the two would marry. But then the town was overrun by marauders, and they killed his parents and took him and sold him as a slave. He said that he had managed to buy his freedom and that he had been, since been searching for his promised bride. Well, today he found her. And she is about to marry someone else. Shouldn't I be heartbroken? I asked him if he could tell me anything about the girl that could identify who she was. He told me that she had a birthmark on her right hand that looked like a star. I knew about her birthmark. I had seen it many times throughout the years. He then took out the wedding contract that both of their parents had signed, and he showed it to me. I told him to wait for a minute, and I would return shortly. So I went to my son Chaim and I said, initially I gave you the advice to marry this girl, but now I'm asking you to step aside and let these two orphans marry each other instead. Now my son Chaim being the sweet person that he is, did as I asked of him and let these two orphans marry each other on that day. The wedding was performed exactly the same as if I had married off my own son. I even provided them with the same dowry imparting gifts that I would have given to my son. With that, I wish them well on their way. And that's the story. The rabbi came around the counter. He wrapped his arms around Moshe, then he hugged and kissed him. He said it would be an honor and a privilege to have him as a chavrusa, a study partner in the next world. You know, the Torah ends the description of creation of the world with the Hebrew word la sot, to do. I recently saw a translation that said, to fix. God has given us his most precious possession, his Torah. He hopes that we will be partners with him, 
by doing positive actions that will allow the world and all of its inhabitants to make this world a dira betachtona, a dwelling place for his divinity to reside in this world. We are one people, one body. We have one God, one Father in heaven who has given us his one Torah. We can only succeed in our mission in life if we acknowledge that every person counts, that we owe our benevolent Father a debt of gratitude for giving us his instruction manual, the Torah. Not just a book for us to study, but for a GPS, a God-positioning satellite, to direct us on our journey through this minefield that we call life. We can only accomplish our mission with the help of others. Yahafta l'riachal kamocha. So let us love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And with that, may we merit to usher in the coming Mashiach Tzukeinu quickly and in our time. Let me thank you for attending and listening to the lecture. Again, may God bless you with health and safety and happiness. Shabbat Shalom. Again, thank you.